Okay, um, good morning guests and um, participants. I'm Boon Yuan from Singapore Polytechnic. Um, our campus is situated on the western side of Singapore for those who are visit, uh, visiting Singapore for the first time. I'm currently teaching in the School of Digital Media and IT. I'm a programmer myself. Actually, my background, I'm, I'm trained as a mechanical engineer and I switched halfway when I did my master's. So yeah, doing designing and developing games for a while. So today, um, today's topic will be on interactive digital games for medical rehab. And um, I'm quite happy to meet some healthcare professionals here, so which is quite a good mix. And initially, I was still thinking that it would be all game designers. Yep. Okay, this is the rough outline. Um, what is, um, I'll just do a brief introduction on what is rehabilitation. And um, just a brief one, okay, I'm not a trained therapist, so yeah and how have games, how the games been used for rehab till now and uh, what are the lessons we can learn from um, all the games that have been developed and designed. Okay, um, just a quick 101 rehab, okay? This one, this definition was taken from World Health Organization. So what is rehabilitation? Uh, it is basically a process, a process. So mainly to aim at um, enabling people with disability. So the person that you're dealing with is people with disability to reach and maintain functional levels. So those are the list of the functional levels that we're talking about. And mainly to summarize it, to attain independence and self-determination. Okay, when you talk about disability, so that's also another thing to watch out for. Um, basically from WHO, yeah, you can see from the details there about 15 out of 100 people have disability and this disability covers three terms basically impairment activity limitation participation restriction now what does what do the, all these things terms mean okay the first thing impairment refers to bodily function for example let's say if a lady has arthritis and it affects her joint her wrist joint that she or even her fingers that she cannot hold things so that's a impairment she cannot flex her fingers Okay, so the next part goes to activity limitation, which if the lady, because of arthritis, cannot hold a toothbrush and brush her teeth. So that limits her activity. And the last part, which is on participation restriction, which means that, for example, because of your disability, you can't take the bus to go to a community center. So that is a participation restriction. Yeah, so that's on disability. The reason why I'm going through that is to understand who, um, what, this, the games are designed for uh, what kind of people and what kind of user. Now, um, previous presentation mentioned about the global issues about aging. Um, at the start of the conference, uh, we, there is a, there's a serious game app that all of us downloaded and installed and we played and we presented challenge about it. Yeah, in the same way, our body is installed with a serious game app from the, since the day we are born and it's called aging. Okay, so every year, if you celebrate your birthday cake, okay, it will present you with a new challenge. Your body is not made to last. So that's one thing. Uh, I know it sounds kind of morbid on a Saturday morn morning. Yeah, so that's one thing that's facing in Singapore. Okay, this is a recent speech by the Minister of State of Health, Dr. Amy Ko. Okay. Now, the, when we design games for rehabilitation, the people that are involved um, are mainly healthcare professionals. And take note, it's not just doctors. There's doctors, nurses, therapies, therapies including speech therapies, occupational therapies, physiotherapies. So it's a big group, and we're moving towards multidisciplinary team in the healthcare um, industry, okay, in treating people for rehab. The next group of people that we have to watch out for in terms of user are caregivers. Uh, which is um, one of the groups that tends to be neglected whenever uh, we, we design games, you know, the caregivers, generally family members. And in Singapore, there's uh, also an interesting tre trend. Um, we, we employ mates. So a lot of times, the mates are the one who actually care for the, the patient, okay, the person who will be going through rehab. Okay, which is also an issue because Families tend to make change made, and after that, you have to do retraining. So that's one thing that's facing um, rehabilitation. Okay, now, what, 
what we have actually involves this is a simple process that's um, that's also in the WHO um, report disability report so mainly um, just briefly going through you have to identify the therapies or the doctors have to identify the problems then they assess what is the problem related to what 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 body functions was affected and they identify it can be related to environment so sometimes maybe because the toilet at home uh, inhibits certain activity you may have to change the environment then they plan intervention measure what kind of exercise you have to do and come assessment which is one area that 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 currently there's a need in there rehab in terms of assessment how effective are the assess uh, are the intervention how effective is the measurement okay just a quick overview of uh, a typical patient journey okay firstly um, for example a scenario if an elderly lady falls down at home and um, have a hip fracture so the main first first place that she will have to go to is to an acute care hospital mainly to address and to um, address the immediate uh, issue for example to um, to actually take care of the the hip fracture okay the broken bone and in acute care um, based on visits that we have done to the hospital um, re basic rehab actually starts in the ward okay rehabilitation so it can be a few days and um, generally it's less than a week okay mainly to keep the body active so there's a general principle is that if you don't use the board the body parts you will lose the function also so they have to keep it active okay then come to the next part which is on rehab center which is not entirely um, correct all the time because sometimes the patient may have to go to community hospital okay for for uh, proceeding further care okay but sometimes they may go back home and they may come back to rehab centers okay and depending on the con condition they'll go through it may be one year and they may recover from there in rehab center they generally spend less of the time and the reason why i'm going through this is so that you can have a appreciation of what they go through the user go through in in terms of treatment this is how it roughly looks like in a rehab center okay they do activities okay and of course there's another place for rehab home ultimately the patient do go home now why do we use um, interactive media for rehab in fact most of us here are from the interactive media industry so I'll just quickly go through why we use games or interactive media for rehabilitation firstly the stimulus control and is, is um, consistent you can control it so as game designers and developers you can control the virtual objects what you want to display when you want to display how fast you want to display and um, like how many of them coming out in one shot so the stimulus control is there and it's consistent okay so it won't change compared to the egg when you time it the egg may come out differently okay and the other thing is real-time performance feedback previously the speaker mentioned about feedback okay that we can have real-time performance feedback with games how well you're doing at the moment in time okay the other thing will be more of um, queuing stimuli okay so to support error-free learning what do you mean by that so for for a patient let's say they have to learn something you can actually use interactive media to guide okay to maybe have tutorials or even while they are doing certain exercises you can actually correct them say hey you need to raise your arm a bit higher okay you can prompt them so that's for queuing the other one with um, even other speakers have mentioned on exploration that humans instinct you know we like to explore okay so it, it also allows self-guided exploration and independent practice so that actually helps to address one of the issue in um, that's facing in terms of rehab that's in manpower okay because of aging population the therapies to patient ratio is affected okay the other one like the chameleon it can adapt to the environment for interactive media it actually allows you to um, adapt there's a capability in adapting to what kind of impairment the patient is facing okay so you can adapt the ui the user interface so that um, it doesn't need that type of input for example if you there's no need to limit to you have to do a left mouse click just to do a certain action you can actually adapt it to the impairment that you're facing 
Now, the other thing that's good and um, a lot of therapists will mention that is that it provides a safe testing and training environment. Okay, for example, a lot of things that we take for granted, let's say for us, as we if we do not have any disability, is like taking the bus is, yeah, just step out of the bus and that's it. But for a person facing uh, with disability who just recovered from stroke, okay, taking a bus can be a challenging thing. So to replicate that, okay, will need time and need planning. So once you use interactive media, there is a chance that you can create a safe training environment, even operating with um, escalators, you know, if you want to train someone to how to use an escalator after a stroke. Okay, and this one we do not have to mention more. It can help to enhance motivation. Okay, because some one of the main big issue with rehab now is that um, patient can get demotivated quickly. And that's why we are using games to help to motivate them so that they will continue. And with the same principle, if you don't use it and if you don't exercise it, you will lose the function. So that's, that's the main reason behind that. And lastly, one of the reasons why uh, we use interactive media is because of low cost. Not entirely in the sense of development because I hear a lot of questions on um, how long is your development time. Okay, true, that, that is a one-off time that you need to actually spend time in it but ultimately when it's time to replicate and distribute it's actually uh, low cost and can be done quickly thanks to the internet yeah okay just to cover a few products that's already out in the market that people use it for uh, physical rehab so this is a product is irex case in us so the, the link is mentioned there. So this is um, using a uh, chroma key screen. That means it's a green screen behind. It's the same concept that's done in um, news reporting where the commentator stand in front of the green screen and behind it is a virtual screen. So yeah, so the, the player can actually stand in front of the screen and start playing and interacting. So yeah. So you meant you, you've heard the, the, the term augmented reality. So this is the reverse, this is augmented virtuality. So the environment is virtual, you put yourself in that environment. So the other technology that you use is using the glove. On the top right hand corner, you see the image. Okay, for Kyushu University, I understand there's a speaker speaking <laughs> in um, the conference. Okay, they have developed something called Rehabilium which they presented in last year's virtual reality conference. Um, this one, this game was um, developed using Wii Balance Board. Okay, it's connected up to the, connected to the computer and it allows standing up training. So what the user do is, or the player do is just to, um, from sitting position, stand up, okay, on the Wii board. So the Wii board becomes your input. So every time you stand up, it actually um, reacts to it. La. So, Okay, let's see. Okay, so, so every time you do an action, you will start growing. Okay, this game is actually designed for uh, elderly patients. So it goes, continue growing, and the, the, the patient, every time they do every motion from sitting position up, it will actually have um, some rewards, la, as how many they do. So um, the researcher that's doing this, this um, game also noticed that um, once they implement this as a group therapy, that means a group of elderly doing it at the same time, the motivation gets higher. They're even more motivated to do it. Currently, how they implement it, or rather they how they test it is the group of um, elderly, the first, first person sitting in front will do it, then the rest will just follow, they do it together. Okay, so that's on Rehabilin. Okay, then um, I believe another speaker, Frankie, also did mention about um, serious game being used in uh, medical or healthcare. He did mention something about um, Kinect, using the Kinect. So there's another association in Hong Kong, which is Association for Engineering and Medical Volunteer. They actually they did it out of charity, so they create um, free games basically to address cognitive rehab. Okay, so one thing to note, um, rehab doesn't just cover motor rehab, there's also the cognitive side, okay, which is to deal with memory, visual discrimination, um, visual perception, stuff like that. 
So they created a few games just putting it online. By the way, this is just delivered online flash games and just allowing the, the elderly to react to it. And you know that it will is actually catered for elderly because you notice that the virtual objects are generally big. Okay. So that to allow them to interact easily. Okay. So it's quite similar to you know, on the first day one presenter mentioned about Lumosity. Okay. Um this this uh, online app. Okay, um, well, this is a bit dark. Okay, um, there's so another paper which um, brought up in 2009. Um, this researcher did this on um, investigating this optimizing engagement for stroke rehab using serious game. So um, what they did was to use PC webcam and to, um, okay, that one is not playing very well, and to actually detect the, the user actually wear a pair of gloves and one is green, one is red. So what they do is they just um, move the hands and the first screen on the top right hand corner is actually a calibration screen. That is to check how much the, the user can or how far the user can reach. So that's for calibration. And the bottom screen is uh, one of the game that they develop for, um, for, for interacting. Okay. What can we learn from this, this paper itself is that um, the main two things the researcher mentioned is that when designing games, we have to watch out for this thing called meaningful play. Meaning, you have to actually give feedback to the user and the scoring and handling of failure that you have to be very sensitive with. And the other thing is the player must be able to relate the relationship, must be able to find or realize the relationship between their action and the system outcome. If they cannot relate to it, then um, the, the motivation will drop. Okay, then the other thing is uh, having different difficulty level and uh, allowing the difficulty to change, adapt with time. Now, then there's another paper which is on using just uh, Wii Remote and a webcam uh, on a color sock to do it. Okay, so how what, what are the main things that uh, we learn from here is that the main thing is to make sure the game is playable for a broad range of uh, stroke patient. One thing you may think that, okay, we just developed one game for stroke patient, that's it, done. It's, it's not as easy as that. Every stroke patient has their individual um, issues or impairment, which is very different, which is actually an issue or rather uh, some a challenge for all game designer. Okay, it's not just a one-size-fits-all solution. It doesn't work that way. So the main thing is, um, the researcher mentioned, that you have to actually use simple games but allows multiple methods of input. And the other thing is you have to include a calibration, as I've uh, shown you in the previous example. You have to calibrate, allow the patient to calibrate to see what's their extreme motion. And the other thing to watch out for is to have direct natural mappings. For example, one thing they notice, if you notice the top game, which is just using a Wii remote attached to the arm and just moving up and down. Okay, now, if you do an unnatural mapping, is when you move up and down, the helicopter moves left and right. So that's unnatural, okay? Which the patient will get very disoriented. Uh, so the main thing, it has to be a natural mapping. So if it's moving up and down, make sure your virtual object moves up and down. So the other thing is um, you have to ensure that the games are valuable from a therapeutic perspective. Okay, so make sure the user motion cover their full range. So if the exercise requires them to exercise full range, then your game has to do that full range of motion and you have to detect compensatory motion because sometimes before of the impairment, they may move other parts of their body just to achieve that motion. So you have to detect that. And the other thing to do is to allow coordinate motion. Because we know that every time when we do an action, it is not just a uh, clenching or releasing of arms. Or it's actually a coordinated movement. It's a moving of your upper limb and your shoulder joint, elbow joint, everything. So it's coordinated. And also the last thing is to have the therapies determine the difficulty. So of course the last thing is to of course make the games fun and challenging. So the audio visuals and having automatic difficulty adjustment. Okay, the other thing that is interesting is that the researcher also did mention that um, non-player characters and storyline is are important in such games itself. And and the other thing is on social connectedness. Now this is another um, group of researchers who have actually built on what was mentioned in the previous one. Okay, so they also use Wii Remote webcam 
and rebalance board, what they did was they actually verified what is actually um, correct. They did calibration and they verified that it, it actually works with um, their testers or their users. Now back in um, Singapore Poly, just now what I mentioned was more of um, the what people have done around the world. Okay, now in Singapore Poly, what we've done for the past few years, okay, uh, in fact it's quite recent, we did is, um, is this one called Piano Hero, mainly to address this thing called mirror box therapy. Okay, this therapy, what it does is if, let's say, um, from stroke, your right hand is impaired, you can't move, there's paralysis, you, what you do is you put a mirror there in traditional therapy, and you try to move the one that is working. And from seeing the one through the mirror, it actually send a, a stimulus to your brain and it actually will improve the other hand that's affected. So that's mirror box therapy. So we actually adapted further. We actually use a data glove, meaning you the, the user will wear a glove and uh, move a virtual. So you will see a virtual hand and they will they will actually practice mirror therapy. Meaning if let's say the this hand is the one that's working, they move this hand, they will see the virtual hand, the, the other side, the other hand that's moving. So it's basically adapting the, replacing the mirror but using uh, uh, another device to do it. Okay, so of course we we realize there are a lot of issues. One thing with the data glove is that it's very difficult to wear on someone who had a stroke. Yeah, it's very difficult. And the other thing is, um, I'm sure some of you will be thinking, data glove, that that is not cheap, by the way. So that's one thing that um, we we have to move on. So the other one, which is, uh, we move on to the next part, which is on uh, immersive one thing about the, the previous project is that you can still see your hand. So we added in a uh, uh, head-mounted display, which adds on to the problem because at the end you realize that if... Uh, has anyone tried head-mounted display before? Okay, it is not light. It is heavy. You try doing it for a patient, I tell you, it is it's almost impossible. So it is humongous and it's quite clumsy. So that's, those are the few things that we learn and we find that, okay, we have to move on to something cheaper and easier to adopt. So which is why in the next phase, we actually try a simple webcam on um, green screen to do the same technology. Now, then the other side, um, one of the projects that I was involved in is um, from National University Hospital, we collaborate with them, is to use a simple uh, uh, Wii remote basically to to allow the user to exercise their arm. Okay, so what the user do will be to do three simple actions, which is to do downwards using the Wii Remote, and then to, um, to do another turning, basically using a barbecue game, okay, a satay game. Okay, we localize it to the local context and to slide. So three action to allow the try. The good thing about this is the therapist could bring this into the ward and straight try it, because all you need is just a laptop and a, a, a Wii Remote. But the bad thing also is that the Wii Remote is, if you have played with Wii Remote, connecting to the computer is quite troublesome, seriously. You have to sync it, and sometimes it may not work, so it is very frustrating just setting it up. And you jolly well have a very good battery, because once it runs dry, you have to do this, the process again. So, yeah. So some, some observation we note is that um, generally the, the patients are happy to play, but um, the therapist did mention that it would be good to target training for daily activities and to allow the therapist to change game over time. And the other thing is sometimes the Wii remote, okay, we were using the first um, generation which, which is without the motion plus. So some actions, if the patient can't get it, they will be doing this, swinging to and fro, and it doesn't react on the screen, they'll get very frustrated very easily. So that's one thing in terms of input. So the therapist was a bit concerned, it's like um, they have to take care that the patient don't get injured because of this sudden movement. Okay, then the other game that we did um, was to use um, infrared motion capture cameras. Okay, similar to the ones that you use in um, video, um, creating of video films, um, motion tracking, like Law of the Rings. Okay, at that time, by the way, Kinect was not out. Okay, if it's out, we will have used it. But that's the only one that we could actually track a simple legs. And that time, the therapist wanted, uh, wanted to have to have a uh, measurement, accurate measurement. So what they did was to put markers and it can actually allow you to jump on the frog. And this, this game was designed for children. We actually worked with KK Women's and Children's Hospital and for children with cerebral palsy. 
Okay, so the, this projector on the floor is quite similar to the one that you see in shopping centers. Okay, the only difference is that um, for shopping center, it works on cha um, shadow or the shapes. You can't really detect um, how well the, the legs is lifted, uh, lifted up above the ground. And th the other thing is the therapist wanted a cor uh, more accurate measurement in 3D space. So that's on this. Okay, then moving on, um, all thanks to Microsoft, they released Kinect. In fact, they released another version of Kinect, which is purely for Windows. Okay, so we, we quickly adapt to it and we use this. And by the way, the Kinect camera is cost about $250. Yep, so relatively cheap compared to the infrared motion capture system, which costs tens of thousands. Yeah, so um, the, the main thing is we created using uh, augmented reality. So the Kinect camera basically is a webcam, plus on top of that, there's a sensor. So you can actually see yourself. So these are all prototypes, by the way. We are still testing out game ideas. This project's still ongoing. And um, the issue with Kinect is, of course, there are noise issue, okay? It doesn't mean that, you know, straight away they can detect where your hand is, okay? And the other thing is it, there's occlusion, meaning if you put your hand behind your back, Okay, that's it. It will not be able to detect your, your hand at all. And the other thing is it, it some there's some inaccuracy if you there's a difference. If if you lift your hand up this way, the Kinect can detect it very well. But if you put it right in front of you, then it, it, it will get a bit confused. And then you you see suddenly you see your graphics start jumbling jumping about because of some inaccuracy in there in detecting. Basically what it does, it, it actually projects a depth field. Okay. Now, in Singapore Poly, what we adopt um, is to adopt this thing called user-centered design process when we do our project. So we focus on um, user design, user research, the first part on designing, and requirements and storyboarding. So what we did is we went down to the rehab center, the hospital, to do qualitative um, research, meaning um, user interview. We interviewed them. So those are some of the quotes that we found from therapists and for patients. Okay, uh, the reason why we did qualitative style is because sometimes quantitative, you give out survey, the, the survey that comes back doesn't really address the real needs that are facing by the patient. Sometimes if you talk to an elderly, the elderly may actually give you more info rather than a survey form. Yeah, so that's one. And so on top of that, then we move on to building the prototype. And of course, it will go to and fro. Okay, it doesn't work the first time. And we have to do testing. We have to go back to the user and do testing. Yeah, so that's the process. Okay, um, so what lessons are, are learned from doing all this project and the projects that and even the showcase have mentioned? Firstly, um, generally for elderly, for them to adopt the game or even to continue playing the game, they must be able to see a perceive, they must perceive that there is some usefulness in the game. Okay, take note, if you make your game easy to use, doesn't mean they will adopt it. Okay, because the perceived usefulness outweighs okay, the ease of use. So they must be able to notice that it's useful to them. So for remote control, even if it's complex, by the end, if they want to watch TV, they will learn it. Okay, so that's one okay, extreme example. Okay, then the other thing is, um, I did mention there's meaningful play. So in there, make sure it, it connects to their friends, family, and from there, they can do learning and growing um, through playing, and they, they would like to contribute back to society too. Okay, so that's on meaningful play. And the other thing is um, the when you do the game design, they will prefer familiar environment. Okay, so sometimes, you know, we'll be tempted to do a spaceship or space invaders for elderly, but you may have to think and evaluate um, to see whether is it suitable in terms of familiarity. Okay, then of course I did mention having appropriate challenges. Okay, so adapt to different motor skills. So um, with this, I did mention about having calibration at the start. Okay, make sure the calibration is easy, not like it takes 15 minutes. Because for a therapy session, it's about one hour to one and a half hours. So the last thing you want is to have half the time doing calibration. Then it's no point doing the game. Okay, then unique to Singapore, um, we have to actually have language supports. Okay, for uh, different races and for different languages. Okay, then the other thing is, of course, do not assume that the patient can do this. Yeah. One thing about games adapted to healthcare is that sometimes we will take whatever that's used in entertainment and straight away use it, it in therapy. In fact, that's what most of the therapists found out when they use straight away pluck out the Nintendo Wii and use it to the actual session. 
And uh, I've actually observed one session where I sat in and they were using Wii Balance Board and they were using this um, ski game. And the patient was so frustrated because the patient just could not do the action. So he cannot even score a single, um, the first level. So after a while, he gets so frustrated, just sat down. Yeah, so just take note, okay? So no extensive movement. You have to be empathized with the, what the limitation is. Okay, and the other thing is to um, put in simple interaction mechanism. Okay, so focus on simplicity and intuitiveness. Okay, and the other thing is to keep the load on memory. So the last thing you want is they have to memorize that, oh, I have to press left, top, down, just to do a certain action. So keep it simple. Because um, for generally for the patient with disability, some of them have cognitive issues. They even have pro um, problem processing some info. So the whole point is to keep the load down. Memory load or cognitive processing. And the other thing I did mention is the mapping, okay, natural mapping. Okay, the other one is having constructive feedback. Okay, um, for the floor projection, we tested it on a child have, um, playing. And after finishing the game, as usual, you know, typical game design, we, we always use the typical words like game over. And he was so disappointed. We were like, what game over? I just finished the game. What do you mean by game over? So, yeah. <laughs> then uh, it was really an oversight when we designed it. So then we realized, okay, it shouldn't be game over. You know, it should be things like, you know, well done, you've done this, you know, I've done this and that. Even though the score was left there, but because of the word game over, he was like so <laughs> devastated and the child was so devastated in that. Okay, so take note and the fear of failure. The last thing you want is to make them feel that, okay, I failed. Then they do not want to even try again. So then that's it, you've lost it. Okay, so have a balance of challenge and risk. Okay, so that, that links to the next point, which is to allow the user to have some level of success, like what I mentioned on the previous one on the Wii game. Okay, allow them to actually experience so that the, they can actually know that, oh, I'm improving, rather than, you know, they get face-to-face -to, -face to what their impairment is and they realize, oh, I can't do it, so they just give up. Okay, then this one I did mention, size does matter in terms of virtual object. Make sure uh, it's big enough so that they can see. Okay, sometimes we take this for granted and we just design everything because of screen real estate, we decide to squeeze things into there, but take note, be sensitive to the user. And lastly, make it easy to learn. That's one thing we faced when we did the Wii barbecue game. And, and the, the, the even though there was a tutorial screen which teach them, but they, it, they, it took a while for them to pick up the, the game itself. And for them, s uh, for one user, actually, it, he just gave up because after a while, he couldn't do it and he just gave up because it was difficult to learn. Yep. So these are the references that I did mention just now. And thank you for your time.